it would be easy to assume that, you know, because Moses was out of the picture and because he was God's man, that that means that God had written off his people. But that was not true. Nothing could be further from the truth. You know, God is working even when we don't see it, see evidence of it. That meant, though, that Moses received the finest education that Egypt had to offer. And we know from archaeology that the Egyptians were advanced in many areas of learning, in, in writing and mathematics. We know that then that it, um, Moses would have learned hieroglyphics. He would have learned, uh, been taught, you know, geometry and trigonometry and history and medicine. He would have learned about music and the art of making war, principles of war. But as as important as all of these secular educational fields were, I believe it, it was overshadowed by the religious education he received from his mother, his slave mother who undoubtedly taught Moses about his miraculous deliverance and that he was born with a purpose, right? He was delivered at birth by the hand of God so he would not be killed. She would have taught Moses about the sovereignty, about the power, about the providence of God. She would have taught him about the patriarchs, about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the promise God had made to his people. She would have also taught him how through Moses they had been spared as a people from starvation from a famine, had come to live in Egypt, and now had stayed and become a, a, a great community, numbering in the millions over the past 400 years, but then to be enslaved by Pharaoh. Moses learned all of this and more. So now we pick it up in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11. One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were, and he watched them at their hard Labor. So Moses is now 40 years old, and, and he's known the best that Egypt has to offer. But he also, also knows that he's not really an Egyptian. He's a Hebrew man who is burdened for the persecution of his people. You know, over in the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 11, the great hall of faith chapter, it says, by faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose instead to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Moses made the deliberate decision, the choice to reject his royal privileges, choosing instead to align himself with his people who were being brutally persecuted. Exodus 2 continues, Moses goes out to be where his people were and watched them at their hard labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people. Verse 12, glancing this way in that and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and he hid him in the sand. Question, was it right for the, was it right for the Egyptian to beat the Hebrew man? No, it wasn't. But, you, but it was legal. It was legal. They're just Jewish slaves. Egyptians could do what they want. No, it wasn't right. Laws are not. That, that's not right. That's, that's disgusting, terrible, gross injustice. But was it right for Moses to kill, to murder that Egyptian man? No, it was not. No, his sense of injustice was right, but his actions were incredibly wrong. Moses did the right thing to stand up for injustice, but he did it in the wrong way. May his, Moses may have thought that he was the one that was going to right this wrong, but he did it the wrong way, and, and his people didn't respect it, respect him for it. Verse 13, the next day he went out and saw the two Hebrews fighting, and he asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? And the man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. And when Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian. You may not know where Midian is. There's a little bit of dispute about, about this, but I, my best guess is I'll show you a map. There's Mediterranean. We'll put that at the top and, and the uh, Red Sea at the bottom. Moses went to see his people in the land of Goshen. But in fear of Pharaoh, he fled across the Sinai Peninsula miles, hundreds of miles away to a land of Midian where today is Saudi Arabia. And that 
brings us to season two in Moses' life. The next 40 years of Moses' life as he lives in exile now up until age 80. Now, when you think about Midian, think about Saudi Arabia, what, what sort of picture comes to mind? Is it lush green rolling hills in Saudi Arabia? <laughs> what do you think of when you think of Saudi Arabia? What? Yeah, dry desert, sand, and lots of it, okay? A lot of sand there. I checked the, uh, the weather forecast today for Riyadh, and uh, 110 degrees. Uh, that's what it'll be, same as it was yesterday, in the same way it'll be uh, tomorrow. What do you think Moses, the prince of Egypt, um, did all those years in Midian, out in the desert? The Bible doesn't tell us much. We do know that he settled down and he started a family and started a whole new life and married a woman named Zipporah, and together they had two children. Other than that, we also know that uh, Moses was a shepherd for his father, Reuel. Um, but did he long for the, you know, the, the swanky, flush palace life, you know, of privilege that he had back in Egypt? Did he long for that? We don't know. Not sure. It's possible that Moses just tried to move on and forget what he had left and forget his people there even. We're not sure. But while Moses may have forgotten, God had not forgotten. God had not forgotten his people. Look down to the end of chapter 2, verse 23. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help came or for help because of their slavery, went up to God, and God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. The point is that God was active during those 40 years, even when Moses wasn't. It would be easy to assume that, you know, because Moses was out of the picture, and because he was God's man, that that means that God had written off his people. But that was not true. Nothing could be further from the truth. Now, God is working even when we don't see it, see evidence of it. Let's continue. Now we're into chapter 3, verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. You say, wait a minute, I thought his name was Reuel. Um, same guy, different names. You can search that out for yourself. Jethro, uh, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the far side of the desert and came to Horeb, the mount of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. Wow. I mean, that's awesome, right? I mean, talk, talk about a defining moment. That's what we've got here. Moses in, is encountering God in a burning bush. Now, that would be a seriously freaky sight, right? I had a couple people say to me last week, Wait, what's going on with that up, up behind you? What's, what is that? You all understand, right? That, that's, that's a, like, okay. If you don't, I'll, I'll pray for you. I get it. You know, some of us don't get those things, but it's okay. Um, so, I mean, that would be a seriously freaky sight, wouldn't it not? Right? To see a bush burning, but not burning up. Now, we've all seen fires, haven't we? We've seen campfires. Some of us have seen a forest fire maybe on TV or hopefully you haven't experienced this, but we've seen house fires. We know how fires work, don't we? When there's fire, it burns something up. Well, here there's a fire, but nothing is burning up. The, bur the bush is burning, but it's not burning up. Verse 3, so Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight. Why this, burns, this bush does not burn up? When the Lord saw he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. So now, just trying to understand this, now we not only have a bush that is not burning up, we now have a talking burning bush that is not burning up. You understand? What we have here is what's known, theological terms, as an anthropomorphism. Love that word. Anthropomorphism, two Greek words. Anthropos, meaning man, and morphe, right, which means form, man form. Um, anthropomorphism is when God reveals himself to us as a human 
or in some physical form. This happens all over the Bible. This is a fascinating study. And we see it from time to time. I try to point you, point you to it. God has all kinds of ways of speaking to us. Do you understand that? He can do anything He wants to do any time He wants to do it, including speaking through a burning bush. Verse 4 again. God called to Moses from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing is holy ground. This is an awesome encounter. And this encounter reveals incredible things, several things about God. We're going to unpack them. First, God is holy. This, this attribute, this characteristic is, is, is the one that's most seen in the Bible about God. Now, when we think about holiness, we may think about goodness. You know, that God is better than we are. That's true. That's infinitely true, but it is infinitely more than that. God's holiness involves His majesty. It involves His glory. It involves His moral perfection. God is, uh, is holy unlike you and unlike me. He is over us. He is above us. He is infinitely beyond us. And yet, God is personal. Notice He comes near to Moses. He makes Himself known to a mere Man, theologians use the word transcendent. God is incomprehensible, and yet He is also imminent. Imminent. He's close. He's near to us. How awesome is that? Verse 6, and then He said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And at this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave dryers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanites, the per Hitt Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and Jebusites, who had taken over the land since the people had left. Of God, verse 9, and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me. And I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing, so now go. I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Verse 11, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? And God said, I will be with you. And this will be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you. When you have brought the people up out of Egypt, you will worship God on this mountain. Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me. And they asked me, what is his name? And what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Now in saying that God's saying that He is I am. God is revealing His self-existence. You know, when you or I see something, right, we know what it is. We know what that something is we, because we've learned about it. We see a chair. We see carpet. We see lights. We see something. So we understand what it is because we've learned. what Someone has told us about it. And if we don't understand, we don't know what someone is something is, we go to find the source, the person who made that, so that they can teach us what that is. Not so with God. Not so with God. God was not created. God was not made. He just is. He is I am. He is the self, the only self-existing one. Chicago preacher from another generation, A.W. Tozer, pointed this out in one of his books, Knowledge of the Holy this is, this is one of the reasons why philosophers and many scientists have so much trouble with God. They cannot quite bring Him down to where they can analyze Him and, and explain Him, as Tozer puts it, to admit that there is one who lies beyond us, who exists, who exists outside of all our categories, 
who will not appear at the bar of our own reason. This requires great, a great deal of humility, more than most of us possess. So we save face by thinking God down to our level, or at least down to where we can manage Him. God is self-existent, and God is also self-sufficient. Self-existent means He had no beginning. Self-sufficient means He has no needs. God doesn't need anything or anyone. He doesn't need Moses, but he has graciously chosen to use him to carry out his plan. God's name also means that he is eternal. Now, you and I came into being. There was a time when we did not exist. We were not, but we are now. But there was never a time that God did not exist. There will never be a time when he will not exist. He has always been. God is eternal. And He is unchanging. He is the God of Abraham. He's the God of Isaac. He's the God of Jacob. And again, the term, the, the term that theologians use is immutable. That means He's never different. God is never different. He was the same yesterday as He is today. And as He will be tomorrow. And forever. And notice that when Moses feels inadequate to what God has presented to him as an opportunity, as a call, right? When he feels inadequate, it's because he is. He is inadequate, absolutely. But God, the holy, personal, self-existent, self-sufficient, eternal, unchanging God will be with Moses as he returns to Egypt. And that brings us to season three. Moses returns to Egypt on a rescue mission. And you read on through chapter 4 and the details, you have details there of signs that God gave to Moses to perform and to demonstrate that he had been sent by God to rescue the Jews out of slavery and to take them back to the land that he promised to Abraham, out to the to land of Canaan. So in chapter 4, Moses then reconnects with his family, including his older brother Aaron, who becomes his chief spokesman. And again, we've studied this in detail in the past. So I want you to skip down to the end of chapter 4, for the sake of time, verses 29 to 31. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen them in their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. Israelites were convinced. But convincing the Pharaoh that the Israelites need to be let go and freed, oh, that's a wholly different deal. That would not be easy. It would be excruciatingly difficult and bring tragic consequences on the Egyptians, as we're going to see next week. That's as far as we're going to go today, Uh, the study of Moses, because we want to pause now and ask the question of the morning. Help me out on three. Lift up your voice, brothers and sisters. One, two, three. So what? Right. Say, I've seen the Prince of Egypt. I think that might be uh, Disney's best one. I've seen that movie. And, you know, I think I'm sort of curious about that whole business of Midian and the sand. And I think it's kind of cool that I think it's kind of cool pun intended, um, that uh, God called, you know, a, a washed up 80-year-old on the backside of the desert to like lead his people. I mean, how cool was that? That's awesome. I'm, I'm in it for old people, you know, I think that's wonderful. But seriously, what does this have to do uh, with us? What, how do events thousands of years ago really have any bearing on your life and mine today? Do they? Well, they absolutely do. What happened in Moses' encounter with God back then has huge implications for you and me today. Because just as God offered Moses the opportunity to be involved in his work, God is still offering great opportunities to you and to me today. It may not be leading two or three million people out of slavery in a foreign country, but parents, grandparents, every time your child or your grandchild asks you to read a Bible story book to them. 
That's a great opportunity. Every time you have the opportunity to serve at VBS, Vacation Bible School, for an intense week, right? Every time you have an opportunity to serve in Discovery Town and make weekly deposits, or in Awana, or in Impact, or in Outbound Youth, those are great opportunities to join God in His work for the next generation. Every time someone asks you to pray for them, that's an awesome opportunity for you to call on the name of the living God on behalf of that person. When a friend or family member asks you something about Jesus, that's an awesome opportunity for you to be a witness for Jesus. Every time we have an opportunity to learn about what God is doing in countries like Turkey or India or Ethiopia or Japan or Thailand or Pakistan, where millions of people who do not, hundreds of millions of people who do not know Jesus Christ, right? But God is at work. Anytime we have those opportunities, those are great opportunities to have our hearts aligned more, more correctly with the heart of God for the nations. And to be challenged that he is going to do even greater things as Jesus promised through us because Jesus has gone to the Father for all who believe. God is still offering great opportunities today. But the question is, are we ready to seize those opportunities when they come? See, the truth is, many of us will miss the opportunities God's brings, God, brings ready, God brings to us because we are not ready. We need to be prepared. So let me quickly give you three keys to, sol- to seizing the moment that flow right out of the passage, what we've studied today. Number one, I must be ready and open to respond. I must be open and ready to respond. Now, being open is key, and not just when you're playing football, you know, as a receiver or uh, playing basketball or hockey or whatever. It's important in life. Being open means that being, you're interested, that you're seeking, that you're curious, that you're leaning into and to knowing more about what God may be doing and how you might get involved in what God is doing. That's what Moses did. That's what Moses was. I'm going over there, and I'm going to see what's going on with that bush. And notice, God did not start speaking to Moses until he expressed that curiosity. Sometimes I think, well, we're, I'm just going to hang back and wait for God just to speak to me. Yeah. You've got to take some initiative here. He took the step to find out what God was doing. We have to be open. We have to be ready. And when God presents the opportunity, we have to be ready. Yeah, That's number one. Number two, I must remember who God is. Eyes off ourselves. Eyes on God. When God told Moses what he wanted to do, all Moses could think of was his inadequacy. I can't do this. I'm the wrong guy, God. Don't you know this? Listen, we need a fresh revelation of who God is. We are not, inad- not adequate, but God is. So the same God that gave Abraham and Sarah, right, a miracle child, Isaac, the child of promise, is the same God who turned incredible evil into incredible good during the time of jo- Joseph, is the same God who was with Moses to deliver his people out of Egypt. It's the same God that will be with you. It's the same God that's with me. So that we can do whatever God calls us to do. We need to remember who God is. Number three, I must be willing to take risks. Say that with me. I must be willing to take risks. Say that again. I must be willing to take risks. Doing what God asks will always involve risk. It will require stepping into the unknown. Now, tending flocks with his father-in-law on the backside of the desert in Midian, that was safe. Returning to Egypt, the place he had fled decades before, fled for his life, I mean, that, that was risky. Or was it? If Almighty God presents the opportunity and he is in it, is it really risk? Or is it just perceived risk? 
I'll leave you with that.